Our next speaker is again uh, is one who can talk about great ideas and uh, ideas which one day will certainly enhance how people live and, and their daily life. Um, Goldie uh, Nejat is, is uh, founder and director of the Autonomous Systems um, Biomechatronics Lab in, in University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Nejat's research is focused on development of intelligent assistive robotic aids and devices that have, can help in finding victims in disaster scenarios, improve the quality of patient-centered care, and transform the way hospital wards and nursing uh, homes function. Uh, in particular, Dr. Najat and her research team focus on designing intelligent robots to address everyday problems to assist and aid people in a number of real-world situations. So. Dr. Dejad is going to uh, inspire us with her work, and we will look forward to her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Anbari, for inviting me here. Um, I just want to start with this slide. This is a slide that I took of uh, a closet in the hospital in Korea. It used to be a cleaning closet, so all the cleaning supplies for the hospital floor were put in here. And then the sign was replaced with this. It's kind of telling you how our future is changing and what's happening in our hospitals are changing. So this is where, obviously, they store the robots for the night. So uh, my area is really in designing assistive robotics. And assistive robotics can be found in a number of different applications, um, from the healthcare end all the way to helping you know, soldiers on the field, to robots that can do house cleaning for you, robots in space that we heard about, um, and robots for search and rescue. If you can take a look at kind of the latter end of this uh, graph, you can see where the boom is in robotics and where it will be in the next few decades to come. And a lot of it is designing robots for the home and, of course, health and welfare of people. As well, of course, one of the big areas still would be manufacturing. Why do we need so many robots? Why are they everywhere? One of the biggest reasons is our elderly population. So Canada, as well as the United States, our baby boomers started retiring in 2011. We need people to take care of them. A lot of our healthcare professionals are the ones retiring, are the ones returning 65. And so they're not gonna be around to take care of us and let alone themselves. So what are we gonna do? How can we fix this problem and help them keep their quality of life? So you can see a few countries have already had a kind of boom in their elderly population, Japan, which you hear on the news a lot, as well as Italy, and Canada and the U.S. are kind of following. Um, we'll hit about 22 percent in a few decades. So one problem, as everybody knows, as we get older, um, we can have health issues. And one big epidemic in the world is dementia, or cognitive impairment. So as you get older, you know, memory starts uh, deteriorating a little bit. Um, some people who get symptoms of dementia have uh, problems doing activities of daily living. So taking care of themselves, for example, eating, bathing, and so on. It's predicted that 115 million approximately will have dementia in the world by 2050. There's no cure for dementia. We know little about the human brain, let alone how to fight symptoms of dementia. So what can we do for this population? One way is to design robots. Now, we see robots in healthcare a lot. They're, I kind of categorize them into two different uh, types, the non-interactive robots. And these you see, of course, helping uh, surgeons in uh, assistive surgery. There's wheelchair robots, um, as well as robots that uh, deliver drugs, and physical rehab robots. And then you look at kind of the interactive, which is the other category, and here you have these kind of lifelike creatures. Um, these robots talk, they display facial expressions, they can help you find, for example, when you go to the hospital, a patient you're looking for, get a health update on them, as well as they help you with cognitive or mental training, brain fitness. 
One big application of these interactive robots is robotic animal therapy. So a lot of nursing homes or long-term uh, care facilities do not allow pets in for a number of different reasons, allergies, infections. And so a lot of people don't get that interaction with pets. What's the next best thing to a real pet? Maybe a robotic dog or a robotic cat. Um, and they've been kind of popping up in a lot of different places from Japan to Italy to US and Canada. And they give you pretty much the same interaction as you would get with a pet, minus the allergies and infections. So they help relax people. They give them psychological um, as well as social benefits. If we look at from you know, that spectrum to kind of our younger uh, generation, robots can be used with children with autism. They help them um, learn social skills, eye gaze, turn taking, um, and kind of engage them in one-on-one -on -one interaction, which may be difficult. Other applications for assistive robots are in the home. Who doesn't want a robot to do all our cooking and cleaning and ironing um, and all the laundry for us? So there are robots that uh, can work in your house, bring you a Coke if you want while you're watching your favorite game on TV, um, help you get out, out of the bed or a chair if you need assistance, physical assistance, and help you communicate with the outside world, get any information, link you to family members, maybe through telepresence. And one of the areas that I'll be talking about the most today is these socially assistive robots. And so these are the robots that can kind of engage you in different types of activities, whether they are activities of daily living, helping you do those, as well as providing you with some kind of stimulation in cognitive leisure activities, so games. Um, being one example, they provide you with some kind of companionship, as well as providing you with that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So one of the robots we've been uh, working on for probably the last six, seven years is Brian. And Brian is a non-contact robot, so he doesn't touch you. Um, he speaks. Uh, you can see he looks very robotic, and that's done on purpose. Um, he can speak. He can display facial expressions, human-like gestures. And he's used for end-of-life care, um, maybe rehab, cognitive rehab, as well as um, con uh, convalescence as well. So Brian encompasses a few different aspects. He's embodied, he's a physical robot that's in front of you. Um, he has emotions similar to us, so he does get sad and happy. Um, he communicates similar to how humans do. So for people who are not you know, used to interacting with robotics, it's more natural, the communication, and he can learn from you. You don't like what he does, you can tell him, so he won't do it the next time. Um, and he can perceive his environment similar to how we do. So why design a human-like robot? So we see all these androids with human-like looking skin and faces, um, these humanoids, ASIMO, uh, a lot of companies and research facilities are designing them. So one of the main reasons is that we find how people interact with human-like um, devices or human-like robots. So if you take it from the other side, think of your alarm clock or your car. When you wake up in the morning, sometimes you find yourself you know, telling your alarm clock to be quiet or five more minutes. You know it doesn't speak back, right? But it made some kind of sound. So you may speak back to it. What about the car? If something's wrong with your car or you know, you're driving it down the road, something happens, you may speak back to it. It doesn't speak. You may speak to it, but it may not speak back to you. So we find ourselves interacting with technology, even though we know that it can't necessarily speak back to us. So what if it's more human-like, and it can actually understand us and speak back to us? Would we be more inclined to interact with it? And that's what we're finding. We're finding that the more human-like these robots are, they don't necessarily need to look exactly like a human, but the more engaging they are, and the more people comply with what they have to say or want you to do. And this becomes important in healthcare. So, for example, you think of when you visit the doctor. If the doctor has something serious to tell you, for example, taking a certain type of medication or doing certain types of treatments, he or she's not gonna laugh when uh, they tell you that, right? It's gonna be a serious interaction. And then other things, jokes or so on, are more lighthearted. 
So a robot should have that balance as well. And based on that balance, you can understand the intent of the robot, which is very important during communication.